Here are a few more interesting topics on heart failure. 1. Is there any role for exercise in heart failure? 2. Metabolic modulation in heart failure. And 3. Cardiac resynchronization therapy in heart failure. Generally, everyone would think that heart failure patients need rest rather than exercise. This is true in case of acute decompensated heart failure. But in chronic heart failure, a monitored exercise program is beneficial. This is analogous to beta blockers, which we avoid in acute decompensated heart failure, but are beneficial in those with stable heart failure. Before going into an exercise program in heart failure, first we will check in which situations exercise is better avoided. Those having recent weight gain needs investigation for worsening of heart failure as weight gain could be due to fluid retention. Arrhythmias occurring during exercise, fall in blood pressure with exercise, those with significant aortic stenosis and cases with acute febrile illness are some of the situations in which exercise program has to be withheld. Just like any other exercise programs, Always start low and build up gradually. Warming up and cooling down periods are needed for each daily session. It should be a monitored and structured exercise program. Exercise has multiple roles in case of heart failure. Before the onset of heart failure, it has a role in preventing heart failure which can be considered as primary prevention. Benefits of exercise programs in those with established stable heart failure can be considered as secondary prevention. Finally, exercise testing has a role in prognostication of heart failure. Impairment in exercise tolerance would indicate a poorer prognosis. One of the earliest studies on the role of exercise in heart failure was a small study published in 1988 with just 12 patients with heart failure. They were ambulatory patients with stable symptoms and underwent conditioning by exercise for 4 to 6 months. Mean training was for 4.1 hours per week at a heart rate corresponding to 75% of peak oxygen consumption. They underwent maximal bicycle exercise testing with direct measurement of central hemodynamics, blood flow to the legs, and metabolic response before and after exercise training. Exercise training reduced resting heart rate and heart rate at submaximal exercise. There was a 23% increase in peak oxygen consumption. On the other side, in patients with symptomatic chronic heart failure, physical inactivity is associated with higher all-cause and cardiac mortality. There was an additive effect of television screen time of more than 4 hours versus less than 2 hours per day on mortality. But there was no significant difference in heart failure hospitalization. At the same time, even modest exercise of 1 to 89 minutes per week was associated with survival benefit. They had analyzed the data from heart failure, adherence and retention trial HART which had 902 patients in New York Heart Association class 2 or 3. Both heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and reduced ejection fraction were included in the study. Follow period was 36 months. Of the 196 inactive patients in the trial, 171 were propensity matched with 342 active patients. 2016 European Society of Cardiology guidelines for the diagnosis and treatment of acute and chronic heart failure has given a class 1 recommendation for regular aerobic exercise in patients with heart failure to improve functional capacity and symptoms and to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization. First set of journal references on the role of exercise in heart failure. 
second set of references. Discussion on metabolic modulation in heart failure. Most of the treatment strategies in heart failure like angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitors and beta blockers utilize hemodynamic modulation. Metabolic modulation on the other hand aims at dealing with myocardial energetic deficiency. Important agents in this group are trimetacidine, ranolazine and perhexylene. Trimetacidine is a 3 ketoacyl coenzyme A thiolase inhibitor while ranolazine inhibits the late sodium current. Perhexylene inhibits carnitine palmitoyl transferase. A meta-analysis on trimetacidine published in 2010 found 17 trials including 955 patients. They found that trimetacidine therapy was associated with significant improvement in left ventricular ejection fraction in both ischemic and non-ischemic heart failure. Trimetacidine was shown to have significant protective effects for all-cause mortality, cardiovascular events and hospitalization. They concluded that large multicentric randomized trials are warranted to clarify the effect of trimetacidine in heart failure. Another meta-analysis published in 2012 had data from 884 patients in 16 randomized controlled trials. They checked the role of additional trimetacidine in patients with chronic heart failure. Hospitalization for cardiac causes but not all cause mortality was reduced by trimetacidine treatment. Trimetacidine therapy was associated with increase in left ventricular ejection fraction, total exercise time and a decrease in New York Heart Association functional class. In heart failure, there is reduced capacity for fatty acid and carbohydrate oxidation. There is impaired function of the electron transport chain, reduced capacity to transfer ATP and inefficient energy utilization in heart failure. All these contribute to reduced cardiac energetic status in heart failure. Perhexylene, which was being used as an anti channel agent earlier, is now being evaluated for its role in the treatment of heart failure. A study evaluated 50 patients with systolic heart failure in a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. Perhexylene therapy was associated with 30% increase in the phosphocreatine ATP ratio. This was measured using phosphorus-31 cardiac magnetic resonance spectroscopy. There was also an improvement in the NYHA functional class in this short term study of one month. An open label study on ranolacin had 41 patients with systolic heart failure and 13 with diastolic heart failure in the study group. Control group had 43 with systolic heart failure and 13 with diastolic heart failure. In the study group, ranolacin was added to guideline driven therapy. Left ventricular ejection fraction increased in 70% of the study group over a mean follow-up period of 23.7 months. In addition to these three well-known drugs, others have also been evaluated as metabolic modulators in heart failure. Yet we need data from large randomized controlled trials before we can use them on a regular basis in this context. Cardiac resynchronization therapy, known in short as CRT, is also known as heart failure device therapy. All patients with heart failure need optimal pharmacological therapy and lifestyle modifications. But in a small subset, there is a definite role for devices. Ventricular tachycardia in a scar of old myocardial infarction may necessitate the implantation of an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. Hypotensive ventricular tachycardia in heart failure is an important cause for sudden cardiac death as it can degenerate into ventricular fibrillation in a short time. Those who have survived a sudden cardiac death are those at higher risk of recurrence and benefit maximum with an ICD implantation. ICD improves the life expectancy by 6 years in these high risk individuals. 
intraventricular dyssynchrony in the presence of severe left ventricular dysfunction is an important indication for cardiac resynchronization therapy. Delay between the contractions of the septum and the lateral left ventricular wall causes reduced left ventricular stroke volume. The important surrogate of ventricular dyssynchrony is an increased QRS duration. In CRT, septum and lateral left ventricular wall contract simultaneously, producing improvement in the left ventricular stroke volume. This is achieved by pacing the lateral wall of the left ventricle through a coronary vein along with right ventricular endocardial pacing. CRT improves the symptomatic status and survival of heart failure patients with left ventricular dyssynchrony. But still, there is a 30% non-responder rate of patients who do not respond to CRT. QRS duration of 150 milliseconds or more with LBBV pattern in a person with refractory heart failure will be a strong indication for cardiac resynchronization therapy. It is often associated with mechanical dyssynchrony and wasted systolic effort of the left ventricle. CRT produces a narrowing of the QRS complexes as the right ventricle and posterolateral left ventricle are paced in synchrony to produce a better left ventricular output. Selection criteria for CRT Severe heart failure, NYHA class 3 or 4 Depressed left ventricular ejection fraction below 35% QRS duration 150 milliseconds or more Most widely used marker of dyssynchrony is surface ECG but it is not an absolute marker as it may not have complete correlation with mechanical dyssynchrony. Left bundle branch block is associated with dyssynchrony of lateral wall compared to the septum. Should be in sinus rhythm for better synchronization and should be on optimal medical therapy. Those with recent myocardial infarction or have undergone coronary revascularization within 3 months as well as those scheduled for coronary revascularization are excluded. This is in view of the potential for improvement in left ventricular function in the short term. Echocardiographic parameters M mode, septal posterior wall motion delay at papillary muscle level in parasternal short axis view more than 130 milliseconds has a sensitivity of 24% and specificity of 66%. Interventricular mechanical delay Difference between LV and RV pre-ejection period Beginning of QRS to beginning of LV ejection in epical 4 chamber view and beginning of QRS to beginning of RV ejection in short axis view. The difference more than 40 milliseconds is significant. Tissue Doppler imaging Septal to lateral wall delay in time to peak velocity more than 60 milliseconds is suggestive of dyssynchrony. Non-responders to cardiac resynchronization therapy. About 30% of patients do not respond to CRT. The reasons could be any one of the following. Not every patient with wide QRS has dyssynchrony and vice versa. Leads may be too close to each other to produce synchronous contraction of septum and lateral wall. Scarred region of left ventricle can cause poor capture and synchronization. Consistent ventricular capture by spontaneous impulses can also prevent resynchronization. This is more likely to occur in atrial fibrillation with fast ventricular rate. Attempts at AV nodal ablation to counter this problem have been tried. In sinus rhythm, this problem can be reduced by programming a lower AV delay. Dislodgement of LV lead can also be a cause of poor synchronization. VV timing may not be optimal in every case. Levo phase of left coronary angiogram to see tributaries of coronary sinus. Levo phase of the angiogram is obtained when you continue the CINE recording till the contrast passes from the arterial tree through the capillaries to the venous system. Levo phase angiogram gives an outline of the coronary sinus and its major tributaries, but it will not be enough for an excellent visualization of the venous anatomy for left ventricular lead placement for CRT. While planning to locate a good vein for CRT, coronary sinus angiography is directly performed 
by retrograde cannulation of the coronary sinus ostium from the right atrium. Care is needed to avoid dissection of the coronary sinus or its tributaries which are thin wall structures compared to the coronary arteries. Since the flow in the venous system is against the direction of contrast injection, proximal balloon occlusion is needed for a good visualization of the tributaries of the coronary sinus. Look out for a continuation video on this topic soon. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe, like, share and post your valuable comment below this video. Kindly press the bell icon after that for getting all updates.